Hi everyone, this is our channel, Meet the Real Story. Please, like, share and subscribe. I do not panic. I simply take a breath, sit down on a stone bench nestled against some building I read about once, but can't remember the name of, and scan my cartoony tourist map for anything that looks familiar. But nothing. Give me a little credit though. Having grown up in a town with a population of just under 2,000 people, a town with a farmland and no streetlights, I am a country pumpkin who's been dropped off in a major city. I'm lucky I haven't wandered off the cliffs by now, only two days into my semester abroad. But culture shock is one of the main reasons I came to Dublin. So even though it is terrifying and unfamiliar, I know that living in another country for five months will definitely help me grow. As they say, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having the new eyes. The weather in Ireland changes quicker than a middle school crush. By now the sky has turned a shade of grey and raindrops are beginning to spatter onto the map in my hands. I had been warned of the rain, repeatedly, before coming. It always falls softly at first, quiet as a page being turned, delicate as lace, but that's all just foreplay. When the wind comes, and it always does. It's no matter though. Studying in this city was one of my greatest desires and I knew the weather was part of the package. Dublin was meant to be experienced in the rain. The streets are full of people, I wonder if they can smell the tourists on me. I've been in Dublin for roughly 48 hours and it has yet to feel like home. Maybe it's because I haven't had time to unpack, eat a full meal, or even think. At one point, I was awake for 35 straight hours and learned that there is a little difference between delirium and insanity. To fight the chaos, I cling to the moments of serenity and hoard them like poker chips I can cash when things become too hectic. My most peaceful moment came on the plane ride here. The flight went by quickly. The wind was at our backs and the stars were ahead. As we approached the Dublin skyline lit up like an artificial constellation, my heart was filled with promise knowing that it would soon beat along with the city's pulse. And even though I have yet to feel at peace, my heart continues to say, you will, you will, you will. The rain stops, umbrellas are tucked away, ready to be drawn when the moment calls again. I think a small part of me likes being lost. I know that if I really wanted to, I could ask any of the passers-by where I am or where I need to go. Everyone I've met so far has been so nice they'd likely offer me a ride there and a pint along the way, let alone directions. It seems strange by European standards, but the Irish people love Americans. And I mean love. They love Americans the way Americans love themselves. They want to know where I am from in the States and what it's like there and what brought me to their neck of the woods. All of it. And they really listen, absorbing every word and filtering them as willingly as if it was oxygen. There are bound to be some bad people here in Ireland because there are bad people everywhere. But with an open mind and a positive outlook, they're hard to find. Ireland as a whole is a country I've long idealized. Its postcards should be hung in the Louvre. Its culture is so rich. It is also home to my favorite writers, as well as my ancestors. I seldom contemplated my heritage before going abroad. Since I'm not of one ethnicity, I never had one predominant country to identify with. My family tree is like a European Union cocktail. Equal parts Irish, English, German with just a splash of Dutch, shaken and not stirred. Living in Ireland, briefly, has changed that. I feel a part of it. I feel it in the words of the Irish people. I feel it in the quiet that hangs over the treeless forever reaching fields. And I feel it in the river as it churns, endlessly dark and endlessly deep. So, as I sit on the same stone bench, gazing at the same animated map, I realize I'd rather be lost here in Dublin than be found anywhere else in the world. My name is Laura, and as a child, I craved unconditional love. But instead of cuddles and family outings, my lasting memories are of bitter rose. My mom never wanted children, she says. She told me that the only reason she didn't get an abortion was that she found about the pregnancy too late. 
My dad left when I was very young, which made my mother resentful. She had to stay and be the responsible mom which she hated. On one occasion, my grandparents took me away and I remember thinking, this is what family should be like. The relationship dissolved completely when I was a teenager. My mom's first love was always men. And when I was 15, she moved to Africa for a boyfriend without telling me. It's something I found impossible to forgive, especially as there has never been an explanation or even an apology. She has contacted me since, but always asking for money. That's why I made the decision to cut all ties with her. I put my mother's behavior down to a horrible upbringing, but she can't make the same excuses for her father. Dad had a lovely childhood, but he has no emotions or empathy for anyone. We haven't spoken in seven years. Although she's so close to his parents and they encouraged her and her dad to repair the damaged relationship, it brought her nothing but more hurt. After he left my mom, he went on to have a new family. That was really hard for me to handle, when he's made so little effort with me. My issues with my mom and dad have badly affected my mental health all throughout my life. I see a therapist regularly now to try to help me deal with the emotions. When I get married next year, neither of my parents will be invited. I grew up thinking I did something wrong for my parents not to want me. My only regret is not telling my dad how much I hated him. I don't hate my mom. I just feel sorry for her and I wish she could see what she's done. Ending all contact with a parent may sound extreme. But for me, it was an act of self-preservation. My dad left when I was 8 and I haven't spoken to my mom once since I moved to Germany 10 years ago. She wasn't maternal and had a really bad temper, which she took out on me. She would never be affectionate and I felt unloved. I believe my mother may have had a miserable childhood, which meant she lacked the emotional tools to be a good parent. After I grew up and had my own daughter, our relationship got even worse. My mother never came to see me or her granddaughter, but she did form a close bond with her son's new family. It hurt me that she made an effort to spend time with my brother's children and not mine. Over time, I have come to terms with the fact that she never loved me. I don't hate her or feel sorry for her. I just don't want her in my life anymore. Andy hasn't spoken to mom for 25 years after they stopped communicating in his early 20s. For him, the problem was a lack of respect and common values. I grew up in a children should be seen and not heard household, where my parents' opinion was the only right one. We would have dinner in silence and my parents never encouraged me in my interests or activities. He says he was never praised for his achievements, only criticized for doing wrong things. Whatever I did, it was never good enough. If I did well at something, my dad would always have to prove he was better. The house rules were strict and he was sent to bed by 10 p.m. every night, even at the age of 16. But instead of sleeping, Andy found himself listening to the radio to escape the boredom. He quickly became interested in current affairs and politics, which gave him a new insight into the world. It made me realize that my parents' views were snobby, sexist, and racist. I was never allowed to voice any opinion that contradicted their views or I'd be sent to my room. It made me lose respect for them. Andy and I were living in the same house, but we hadn't had a conversation for over a year. I can't say I regretted not making up with him. He was miserable to be around. Several years later, Andy graduated from university and bought a house. I was so proud, but my mom told me it was horrible. She said it looked like a council house and asked why he wanted to live in a slum. As his career advanced, she became more critical and constantly compared him with his half-brother. I was 21 and felt successful, but she was ashamed of everything I did because it didn't fit her snobbyish ideals. Eventually, he stopped contacting both my mother and his brother and has never looked back. It wasn't really a difficult decision to make because we had nothing in common and they didn't accept me or my life choices. Andy understands why some people see this as a surprising decision, but has no interest in sustaining a relationship for the sake of it.
I feel like seeing your parents out of duty is wrong. If you have made no effort to build a relationship with your children, I don't think you can expect them to be there. For other families, the rift is a result of the parents' divorce. Like my friend Helen, she lost contact with two of her four adult children this year. After ending an emotionally abusive relationship with their father, since they separated in 2011, it's been a slow process of parental alienation. Her son hasn't spoken to her since last year, and her middle daughter is now ghosting her on every channel of communication. She believes her former partner has used the same manipulation tactics on her children as those that destroyed their marriage. Once the kids got older and she developed her own life and interests, her ex became controlling and tried to stop her from doing the things that she liked. During a period of gaslighting that spanned many years, she says he told lies about her behavior to friends and family. Once he told them she was drunk and suicidal and she had gone missing. In reality, she had gone to the supermarket. When she joined a local band, he told everyone she was crazy and that she wanted to run away and become famous. Over time, her husband's side of the story was believed and Helen began feeling alienated from her family. She sadly lost her mom a few years ago and her dad is a man's man and took her ex's side. The divorce impacted the children big time and damaged them emotionally. Despite making every effort to build bridges with her children, she admits she doesn't know what their father has told them. He has always made an argument before parties and celebrations to prevent her from coming to the event. He also accused her of having an affair even though she never cheated on him. Their relationships with her two estranged children became so strained that she wasn't given a chance to discuss what had happened. The only explanation they've ever given her is that she doesn't care about them or that she treats them as little kids. Though losing contact has been an extremely painful experience for both of us, I don't blame anyone. Not me, not my mom, not Helen, and not her children. It's no one's fault. I can very much relate to how Helen's children felt. They're like goldfish swimming in a tank where someone keeps adding a tiny bit of color every day until they start to see things in a completely different way. I would love a chance to reconnect with my mom, but I can't see how it will happen. At the moment, I feel like I'm standing outside and they're inside a glass room. I really miss my mom, my brother, and definitely my dad.